Yeah. So our next speaker is Professor Bong Wang from Berkeley, and he's going to talk about tunable mount insulators, superconductor, and turn insulator in trilithography for nitride uh, Moore super lattices. Oh, first I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, so today I will tell you uh, some of our work on trying to engineer correlated as well as uh, topological phenomena in trilayer graphing and uh, uh, boron nitride Maurice superlattice. Also, since the discovery of graphing, there really uh, are more and more interest in trying to study different type of uh, uh, van der Waals uh, heterostructures because we can exfoliate quite a few different materials now uh, to kind of a single unit cell thickness and we can also uh, stack them uh, together with great flexibility. Uh, and this stacked heterostructure are quite interesting uh, from two aspects. One is like, uh, or since each layer is only a single atom thick, so all the electrons are at the surface. So when you stack two layers together, they actually see each other. As a result, whenever you make a heterostructure, it's really a completely new material that's very different from isolated two separate layers. So suddenly you have a huge phase space to look at kind of quantum materials that don't exist before, and you can just make them simply by stacking. And the other very important thing uh, for the vendor of stacking is actually during some kind of a lucky nature magic, uh, when you stack two things in kind of ambient condition, if you talk to uh, ultra-high vacuum surface scientists, they will say, you will never get a clean surface. But quite amazingly, for this Van der structure, they actually, when you try to push them together, they that self-cleaning process. So all the dirty things on the surface, since they are very loosely bound, they actually will get pushed aside. So as a result, you get almost atomically clean interface, and that's really important. Uh, if you want to have a real heterostructure and study intrinsic properties. And the other uh, very nice thing about the, the Van der Waals uh, stacking is, uh, or since the interaction between layer and layer are relatively weak, you don't need lattice match in order to create heterostructure. So that basically gives you a lot of freedom. Um, so all people are playing with all kinds of Van der Waals heterostructures. Uh, and for a long time, people have seen very interesting phenomena in graphene, transition metal, dichotronite, and so on and so forth. But most of those behavior are pretty well described by single particle physics. So for a few years, uh, we start to ask, like, uh, oh, is it possible to use the flexibility of this Van der Waals heterostructure to engineer strongly correlated phenomena? Uh, and the reason that we all would like to go in that direction is because so we all know that uh, condensed matter physics are a very important topic is actually the e effect of correlations. So we know like in single particle picture, for example, uh, or you can just calculate the electronic band structure and we can easily tell whether you have a metal or insulator by just looking at where the Fermi energy is and where you are feeding your band. So if you fill your band to kind of a half field or fractional field, we know you have three electrons that move around, you basically have a metal. On the other hand, if you fill the band kind of a, or between kind of two separate bands, then there is a gap in the middle, so we get semiconductor and the insulator. So of course, that's extremely powerful in study uh, a lot of like uh, physics of say semiconductors and so on and so forth. Uh, but we know this single particle picture is not complete uh, when you have very strong electron-electron interactions. And what one of the most uh, prominent examples for correlated electron state uh, may be the multi-insulator. So if you have half-field uh, band, if the electron-electron interactions are weak, we know oh, it's a metal. But on the other hand, if the electron-electron interaction is extremely strong and the electron uh, electron interaction energy say is even larger than the bandwidth of basically this single particle band turns out it will form a kind of multi-insulator basically you uh, split this band into a lower Hubbard band and a higher Hubbard band and the gap is largely determined by basically interaction energy minus the bandwidth so the easiest way to appreciate the multi-insulator is actually in the real space so if you have half field band that means uh, or you have one electron per lattice site if you have only spin degree of freedom, basically. Uh, so 
So, or you can kind of visualize something like this. So if there is no electron-electron interaction, you can imagine at a single lattice side, you can put two electrons there, spin up and spin down. Uh, so basically, there is really no energy penalty to put kind of another electron at the same lattice. So basically, you, you get a metal if you neglect all the electron-electron interaction. On the other hand, if the electron-electron interaction is very large, we know there is a huge penalty of energy if you want to kind of stick two electrons on the same side. So that Coulomb potential basically uh, penalize, uh, to try to avoid double occupancy at every single side. So as a result, if you have one electron polarity site, basically you get a multi-insulator. Uh, and this multi-insulator is uh, really interesting from several different perspectives. Uh, first, if you just look at the kind of a metal state and insulator state, we know things behave, I mean, we know what the kind of limiting case is. If there is no interaction, we get metal. When we get the interaction is very large, so let's say U is the interaction energy and the T is kind of the tunneling uh, probability or relate that's associated with uh, basically the bandwidth. So if the uh, potential, I mean the, the uh, interaction energy is very large, we know it's an insulator. But the transition between this metal phase to the insulator phase turns out to be a very interesting and an extremely difficult uh, problem. And the reason is, uh, unlike, say, a magnetic uh, transition, ferromagnetic transition, you can easily define an order parameter, the metal insulator transition is actually very tricky because uh, on the one side, the fundamental excitation in metal are like fermionic excitations. Uh, but uh, the fundamental excitation in insulators are usually like bosonic excitations, like spins, excitons, and so on and so forth. So it's, there's really no well-defined order parameter that naturally link this metal transition to the insulator transition. Therefore, or after almost, more, or almost half a century, there is still no well-defined understanding on how the metal to insulator transition uh, happens. Uh, in addition, uh, if you go beyond just the half feeling, if you have, say, dope multi-insulator, People also believe that it's very closely related to uh, high temperature superconductors. And through the study of high uh, temperature <coughs> superconductor, people uh, discovered uh, all many different interesting phenomena that can potentially be related to doped multi insulator, like uh, or unconventional <coughs> superconductivity, quantum critical point, strange metal, and quantum spin liquid. Um, so, there are still many, many outstanding questions actually related to this model physics because theoretically to get a kind of full calculation and a reliable calculation is extremely challenging with a strong correlation. So, as a result, it will be really desirable to have like a, or a systematic experimental system where you can tune a lot of physical parameter kind of in a controlled way and study how the different phases and how the different phenomena actually compete uh, with each other. So that's why we want to use actually 2D Van der Waals heterostructure as kind of a model system that can potentially let us address these questions. Okay, so how can we do it? Uh, so let's actually just start with some very simple kind of uh, estimation on what we need to do uh, in order to engineer strong correlation in some very general uh, concept. So if we think about the bandwidth, uh, if you think about the electron in a periodical potential, we all learned from Hittel, the periodical potential basically can open up a gap at the edge of the Brillouin zone. And the bandwidth of the lowest energy band is roughly determined by the kinetic energy at the edge of the Brillouin zone. So the bandwidth is roughly in the order of uh, p squared over 2m. And we know if you have a lattice uh, period of, say, L, then basically the momentum is de defined by pi over L. So basically, bandwidth has this form. It's roughly 1 over the effective mass of electron and 1 over L squared. And then if we want to engineer a strong correlation, basically, we really want to play the competition between the uh, on-site Coulomb energy and the bandwidth. So, and we want the basically interaction energy to be larger than the bandwidth. So, uh, how can we do that? If 
we can have a simple estimation of the Coulomb energy. So basically, uh, it's roughly E squared divided by the relevant length. So again, if you have, say, on-site energy with one electron per lattice site, the relative length scale is about L, and it's kind of screened by the dielectric constant, epsilon. On the other hand, if you uh, want to, uh, I, I mean, as I mentioned, if you think about the periodical kind of potential, it will create the lowest energy band with a bandwidth defined by this. Uh, and then in order to get large U over W, you can see the ratio of these two scales with Me times L. So it's actually very simple to see how we can get strong os oscillation. So you need a large, e large e enough effective mass and large enough uh, lattice constant. So as long as you go in that direction, sooner or later you'll push things in strong correlation. Uh, of course, uh, for experimentalists, it's important to know well, how large is large. So if we actually uh, put in some numbers, so let's assume we have an effective dielectric constant in the order of 4 that happens to be the dielectric constant of, say, boron nitride. We found in order to have U over W to be around 1, and if the effective mass uh, is about uh, one rest mass of electron, we found you need a lattice size to be about one nanometer. On the other hand, if you can make larger lattice size, say make a lattice size in the order of 10 nanometer, you can relax the requirement of effective mass. So even if the effective mass is as small as 0.1 rest mass, you can actually uh, uh, get a strong correlation, U over W uh, to be one. So, okay, so basically we know that we need basically engineer large lattice size and need a reasonably large effective mass. So the good thing about uh, uh, 2D heterostructure is uh, the large lattice size can be easily realized through the so-called Maurice super lattice. So for example, if you have a piece of graphene and a piece of boron nitride, they both have hexagonal lattice with very slight lattice mismatch, about 1%. And if you just stack them together, even with perfect alignment, that means zero twist angle, because the lattice constant is slightly different. So what you can see is uh, they will actually emerge a new periodical kind of structure uh, that is about uh, determined <coughs> by the lattice mismatch of these two materials. So you can see the emergence of a new period known as a Mori period. Uh, and for graphene and boron nitride at zero twist angle, the Mori period is about uh, 15 nanometers. So there's a large periodical uh, lattice. The other important thing is basically, or well, since these are atomic thin material, this Mori super lattice indeed create a Mori potential for the electrons. So this actually period does play a role to define the electronic band. So we get this uh, kind of Mori mini band. Uh, with uh, very small uh, bandwidth. So once we can get a lattice size of this, uh, we know all we need is an effective mass that's larger than or roughly 0.1 uh, rest mass of electron. Uh, so one thing that we know is actually this doesn't work well if you put monolayer graphene on boron nitride because monolayer graphene actually has zero effective mass, so that's kind of a, the worst uh, place to look at if you want to engineer strong correlation. So, uh, oh, what are the choice? Uh, if you go to actually transition metal dicotinide, dicotinide, that's a semiconductor with well-defined mass, and the mass is known to be in the order of 0.5 or even larger. So that must be a very strongly correlated system if you actually create a Mori super lattice with 10 nanometer period. Uh, if we want to stick with graphene, a choice is actually the uh, go beyond the monolayer graphene, go to say ABC trilayer graphene, I will show you that uh, when you stack uh, graphene into multi-layers, the band structure actually changes systematically. And in particular, if you go to, say, tri-layer graphene, uh, the band actually can become reasonably flat, and the effective mass will be larger than 0.1 uh, rest mass of electrons. So that can also give us a uh, strong uh, correlation. So today I will focus on, I mean, this lecture I will focus on the ABC tri-layer graphene system because it turns out for electrical transport, uh, graphene is much better, although the mass is not as high. Uh, you can easily do a, a lot of uh, electrical uh, characterizations. Uh, the transition metal dicotinite, it turns out uh, transport is much harder to do because it's very difficult to put the contact. But nevertheless, um, the Maurice super lattice still give rise to very interesting 
uh, say, optical phenomena, and that's what I will talk about uh, in the afternoon. So uh, let's look at the graphene. So I will uh, show you that, indeed, when you have trilayer graphene on boron nitride, you actually can engineer a very strongly correlated uh, uh, state. So we can realize a multi-insulator, uh, which has interesting kind of a quantum transport uh, behavior. And when you dope the multi-insulator, you can realize a kind of a superconductivity. And in, even more interestingly, it turns out by applying electric field, you can actually even change the topology, topological nature of a band and realize kind of a, a topological uh, chain bands. So let me uh, start first with uh, how we actually get strong correlation and to realize the multi-insulator first. So uh, when you stack graphene together, they are actually uh, the lowest energy uh, stacking actually has well-defined uh, 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 stacking order between different layers. So if you go to from monolayer to bilayer, you get so-called banal stacking or AB stacking. And if you go to bilayer to trilayer, it turns out there are two possible stacking orders. One is known as ABA and one is known kind of as ABC. So what happens uh, is basically shown here. So if you in like what uh, uh, Liang uh, told us uh, previously, for a monolayer graphene in a single unit cell, you have two sublattice known as AB sublattice. And if you stack them together, this is how AB sublattice look like uh, for AB A stacking. So basically, you can see A2 is sitting on top of B1, then B3 is sitting on A2. So basically, the, the top layer and the bottom layer actually align the same way. So they are known as kind of AA, and the middle part is B. But it turns out the more interesting one, the so-called ABC stacking, it has kind of this staircase type of alignment. So um, the A atom on the middle layer sits on top of B atom of the bottom layer. A atom of the top layer sits on the B atom of the uh, middle layer. But the kind of top B atom and bottom A atom are actually separate from each other. So the nice thing uh, for the trilayer graphing in this ABC stacking is basically it can actually give you a rather flat band. And we can understand it in this way. So if we just consider the energetic state at the K point, so the, the, these two atoms sitting directly above and below each other basically can hybridize very strongly. So what that means, it will form bonding state and anti-bonding state and push states away from the Fermi energy. So similarly, uh, it happens to these uh, two atoms. So as a result, at the low energy, uh, you have only two states left, the B3 atom, the top B atom, and the bottom A atom. So they are degenerate and sitting at zero energy at K point. And then if you look at the dispersion, that actually is determined by how strong these two atoms couple with each other. That determines the dispersion. And you can see, oh, they are very far away from each other, so they do, do not couple very strongly. So if, you, uh, if the coupling can happen only through nearest neighbor hopping, then you can see it actually has to go through basically three bonds in order for the bottom A atom to couple with the top B atom. And it turns out for graphing, uh, the number of bonds that you need to go through actually tells you the dispersion relation. So for monolayer graphing, A, B atoms, kind of a go through only one bond, then the energy is proportional to momentum to the first power. So there's a linear dispersion. For bilayer graphing, uh, the A and B has to go through two bonds. It actually has a parabolic dispersion at the low energy. And for ABC trilayer, since it has to go through three bonds, it actually has a cubic dispersion. That means the dispersion at the low energy is very, very flat. Uh, if you go beyond the nearest neighbor hopping, it turns out uh, the band structure will change a little bit, so it's not perfectly cubic dispersion, but it still remains very flat. So this actually is a through band uh, structure calculation, including beyond the kind of nearest neighbor hopping. So this flat dispersion basically tells us there is a very large effective mass, and that's indeed what we want. So we want large effective mass plus kind of more periodical potential. Uh, another very nice uh, aspect of uh, trilayer graphing is uh, uh, or when you apply electric field, you can in situ modulate the band structure very effectively. So as I mentioned, for pristine bilayer graphing, it has zero gap because the top B atom and the bottom A atom has degenerate energy. Uh, and it's protected by the inversion symmetry in the total system. 
However, if you apply simply a vertical electric field, what you can see it can generate a potential difference between the B atom and the bottom A atom. And that basically will break the degeneracy and create a finite band gap. So with a vertical electric field, you can actually uh, switch the band gap from zero to finite. So that's very important in two ways. One is it actually provides us a very powerful way to modulate the band structure in situ and study how does it affect the uh, physical properties. And another aspect that's very important is actually it open up gap and close a gap. So once you have gap uh, closing, uh, we all know that's actually very closely connected to topological changes. So as I will show later, like when you switch the electric field, it not only changes the bandwidth itself, it turns out it also changes the topology nature of the band. Uh, okay, so let's uh, say a little bit about the experiment. So we know trilayer graphene on ball nitride is likely to be an interesting uh, system to study how, how, how do we make a real sample coming with trilayer graphene. Uh, so if you exfoliate, say, bulk graphite on the substrate, uh, you can find like three layer system just by luck just or sometimes you find monolayer sometimes you find bilayer sometimes you find trilayer and for the trilayers it turns out they can have both ABA and ABC stacking and the uh, whole ABA unfortunately is a little bit more uh, stable than ABC so only a relatively small fraction actually uh, uh, is ABC so we kind of need to identify the right uh, stacking order in these trilayers and in our group, we use this kind of, uh, uh, this near field infrared nanoscopy to determine basically the stacking order of a trilayer graphene. So the idea is uh, you actually shine an infrared light uh, onto a kind of an AFM tip that's coated by gold. Uh, and then you measure kind of the scattered light uh, uh, in the far field. Uh, because the kind of a right at the metal tip, it acts as a, uh, kind of a antenna, so it basically focuses the electromagnetic wave energy right below the tip. So as a result, we can actually selectively probe infrared response of an area below the tip with, say, tens of nanometers <laughs> spatial resolution. Uh, and because ABA and ABC stacking has different structure, and they basically have different electronic band and infrared response, so as a result, when you look at kind of the infrared uh, scattering coming from the ABA and the ABC region, they give you very different contrast. And that's uh, all shown kind of like here. So we can exfoliate our trilayer graphene and we can just do regular AFM measurement. So we can see the topo uh, topography. We know basically this monolayer, this uh, kind of a trilayer, they have different height. But on this piece of trilayer, it looks kind of homogeneous everywhere. Uh, if you just look at, yes, the question. Does the substrate affect the electronic properties of the trial layer? Because previously you spoke about the trial layer in vacuum. Yes, so a... the substrate will also change the trial layer property uh, a little bit. For example, it can introduce a finite dope in the system. Uh, the nice thing here is basically we mainly look through the contrast difference. So as you can see here. So, I mean, even if it uh, kind of uh, the substrate affected each property a little bit, uh, it turns out to be not that dramatic. And the difference between ABA and ABC is very, very strong. So, uh, yeah, so basically if you look at topography, the height is almost kind of uh, the same everywhere. But then if you look at the, the uh, kind of near field infrared uh, nanoscopy, you can see that it actually is composed of very different domains. And they, you have, say, ABC domain over here and ABA domain uh, over there. And then what we do is we actually isolate this uh, ABC domain through some kind of uh, AFM-based lithography and then pick it up with boron nitride, uh, purposely try to align it with boron nitride to form a uh, close to zero twist angle uh, in order to get more recipolatis and then fabricate a device with uh, kind of a whole bar geometry as well as top and bottom gate. So it's kind of important to have dual gate in this uh, kind of device. So basically, I show here you, you have ABC trilayer graphene, you have uh, uh, both a top gate and a bottom gate. And the reason is when you have kind of a two gate voltage, uh, it basically gives you two controls. It allows us to control two important parameters in the system, basically the carrier doping in the trilayer graphene 
as well as a net electric field uh, through the trilithography, and we can control them uh, independently by basically using the correct combination of the top and bottom gate voltage. Yes? Is the trilayer uh, aligned with both top and bottom? Uh, so most of the time it's actually aligned only on one side, so it's really just by luck. Okay, so um, so let's actually see once we make the device, how does the transport behavior look like? So uh, first of all, uh, I mean, we don't apply any vertical electric field, only change the doping in the system. So this is kind of a calculated single particle band structure of the uh, Mori bands of the trilayer uh, in the system. So what you can see is like, uh, oh, you indeed form this uh, kind of a Mori mini bands due to the potential. And you can also, so this red one corresponds to the kind of a, the first uh, whole mini band. As you can see, this band is already relatively narrow. So the bandwidth is about 20 milliEV. And if we calculate the relevant uh, Coulomb potential energy by E squared over epsilon times L, we found that's also about 20 mEV. So you can see the kind of uh, interaction energy and bandwidth are start to be comparable. So they should have some correlation behavior already. And indeed, if we measure the resistance uh, Xx as a function of doping, this is what we see. Uh, first, you, you see this fairly prominent uh, kind of resistance peaks. So this one corresponds to zero doping, so that's at charge neutral point. And then this large kind of uh, resistance peak actually corresponds to a completely filled band. So if this band is completely filled, you have like a, a large resistance peak. Uh, and for uh, uh, graphing, uh, to fill a band completely, you actually need four electron holes per lattice side because you have both spin degree of freedom and value degree of freedom. So you have two times two degree of freedom. Uh, the, but on the other hand, uh, the interesting thing is actually what happens between kind of the empty band and the complete field band. We see that close to half filling, or there is actually a small bump coming in. So that's already kind of uh, indicating the single particle picture is not that great because in single particle picture, like when you feel half of the band, you usually get to the maximum carrier density so you would expect a very small resistance, but here you find the resistance is actually not that small. Uh, nevertheless, the correlation is not strong enough, so we would like to see more multi-insulating state. And the good thing about trilayer graphing is you can actually control the ratio between potential energy and bandwidth in situ just by applying a vertical electric field. Uh, uh, so here we basically show the band structure when you apply a vertical electric field so that you open up a gap about 20 mEV. So as I mentioned, if you apply vertical electric field, you can split, uh, basically, if you don't apply the magnetic, uh, vertical electric field, the kind of conduction and valence band are touching here, still there's a zero gap. If you apply a vertical electric field, basically you open up a, a gap over here. And once you open up a gap, you can think it's basically effectively squeezing the valence band. So you can see basically initially the band is going from here to here. So once you squeeze the valence band, basically you have a flatter band, and you increase the ratio between u over w. So now in this case, we have a bandwidth in the order of like 10 mEV. So that's now quite a bit smaller than the potential energy. And if you then look at uh, the uh, transport behavior, you can see now you actually see well-defined resistance peak, both at uh, half feeding as well as uh, at quarter feeding. And these, uh, we believe, are corresponding to basically multi-insulating state, uh, where you have basically two whole palladic side and one whole palladic side. And in particular, the quarter feeding uh, really shows you have basically one hole at each lattice side, and that actually gives you a kind of a multi-insulating state. So uh, oh, we have the multi-insulator, so let's see actually how does the transport uh, behave, uh, uh, behave in this system. Uh, as a function, say, uh, as doping, bandwidth, as well as uh, temperature. So let's first take a look at uh, the temperature uh, dependence. So here I plot the resistance as a function of uh, kind of doping again at a different temperature. So as you can, uh, and we focused here at quarter feeding and half feeding uh, peaks. So what you can see, indeed, 
these two uh, resistance peak behave as insulator. When you go to lower temperature, the resistance becomes uh, much higher. And below this kind of uh, insulating state, you basically have a metallic state. Uh, basically, you have like a resistivity that uh, kind of a decreasing uh, at lower temperature. So basically, we have insulator and metal. And of course, uh, or in the middle, when you go from insulator to metal, there is kind of a, a metal insulator transition. And it's quite interesting to notice that uh, all for most of these kind of uh, curves, when they go through the cross, they cross at a single point. So that basically means at this crossing point, the resistivity is actually temperature independent. So go all the way from, say, 1.5 Kelvin to 30 Kelvin uh, is actually, uh, the, the resistivity is within kind of a few percent. Uh, and we were told by uh, uh, Santo, uh, this is actually, could be a kind of indication we actually have a quantum critical point uh, between the metal insulator transition in 2D. So uh, it turns out 2D uh, quantum critical point should have a, a, a temperature independent resistance. And then we also uh, zoom in this region and try to do some kind of scaling behavior to see how uh, the different temperature uh, curve look like. So what we found is you fix at this crossing point and kind of scale the different uh, temperatures, uh, they can be reasonably well collapsed uh, into two universal curve, uh, and uh, we can fit it with basically a scaling behavior like this. So this is a delta V basically tells us the kind of doping deviant from the uh, crossing point and temperature to like a, a certain index, and we have a scaling law about two third. Uh, we can see that the uh, scaling behaves quite well uh, with a relatively limited temperature range from about 6 Kelvin to 20 Kelvin. So we understand why it should deviate at high temperature, because at very high temperature, the multi insulator actually uh, melts. So basically, we know everything should be uh, different. Uh, we don't quite know why at lower temperature it doesn't behave very well. Uh, it's possible defect and homogeneity start to uh, play a role. I do, I, I do want to uh, make a comment, actually. People have also done this kind of uh, 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 metal insulated transition in high TC superconductors. And they were also able to see uh, almost like temperature independent uh, kind of crossing point with a similar uh, scaling factor, incidentally. Um, and in that case, it turns out that the kind of temperature range they have good scaling is also about a factor of two or three. Um, that's somewhat uh, similar to what we see here. Um, and then uh, we can, uh, in addition to the temperature dependence, we can uh, further look at the tuning behavior of this uh, multi-insulator. So basically here I plot a two-dimensional uh, phase di diagram. So the color shows the uh, resistivity and the vertical axis uh, is the kind of bottom gate voltage and the horizontal axis is the top gate voltage. So if you kind of uh, go along that direction, that actually corresponds to fix the doping, but just changing the, sorry, that direction we are changing the doping with a fixed vertical electric field. And in that direction, basically, we kind of are tuning the band, uh, bandwidth uh, by changing the vertical electric field, but fix the doping. So as you can see, basically, the quarter filling peak and half filling peak exist over a fairly large parameter range. Uh, but they only appear when the bandwidth uh, kind of is narrow enough. So to some extent, this really becomes a very nice model system to compare with theory. I mean, this kind of drawing has existed in theoretical literature or for many decades. So what it says is basically, if you tune the bandwidth, you should have a multi-insulator to metal transition. And then if you change the doping uh, in either way, you can also have kind of a uh, doping or feeling controlled metal insulated transition, but usually it's very hard to study it in a real experiment because or either to change the bandwidth, most likely you actually really need very different uh, kind of a material system, and the change in doping very often it actually needs you, you need to synthesize different materials. But now with uh, kind of uh, this graphene, trilayer graphene or boron nitride we can realize all these kind of uh, uh, feeling controlled and bandwidth controlled metal insulating transition basically in the same 
uh, material experimentally. And here I show you the example that uh, for the close to the half filling and quarter filling, basically um, the, the, the dot shows basically where the crossing point happens. So basically inside we have uh, basically a kind of insulator regime and outside we have metal regime. So basically in this direction, by changing the vertical electric field, we have a bandwidth controlled metal insulator transition. And in this direction, basically we can have like a feeding or doping controlled uh, metal insulator transition. So, uh, so we are still trying to understand this uh, behavior more by discuss with a uh, uh, theorist uh, and see exactly what we can learn about this uh, uh, metal insulator transition in multi insulators. Okay, so let me move on, but uh, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let's actually see what happens uh, when we all dope the multi insulator and go to even lower temperature. So we all know that uh, uh, if you dope uh, or have doped multi insulator, it's possible that you can get high TC superconductors. Yes? Could you return to the previous slide? Uh, so uh, this phase diagram, uh, if you have half filling and you just add or uh, drag some electrons in or out, uh, don't you get immediately conductivity if we're talking about the most, uh, the most scenario? Yeah, so it turns out, so all these measurements are actually done at 4 Kelvin. Uh, so at that temperature, we actually haven't seen any superconductivity and that's what I want to cut next. So if we go to lower temperature, superconductivity does emerge in some phase space. Okay, so, so, all, so we basically are asking that is it possible to see superconductivity when you have doped multi-insulator. And then, uh, uh, as you can see, we actually have a fairly large phase uh, uh, space uh, over here. And uh, it turns out superconductivity doesn't always exist. It's not like when you dope all the multi-insulator uh, at least in our system, you always get superconductors. So only in our kind of finite uh, phase region, we can see superconductivity. And in order to find the right region, we first compare the global phase diagram uh, at 5K versus at like, uh, say, uh, 50 millikelvin. Uh, and we found that actually the response change mostly over here. <laughs> So you can see this is a kind of a somewhat insulating behavior and this become very kind of a conductive. So we actually then focused on those regions which we think most likely that we uh, might be able to see superconductivity. And indeed, uh, uh, if we, uh, so that happens to be close to quarter filling, as you can see. Um, uh, and a fairly high displacement field. And indeed, we, we see a significant drop of the resistivity by say 30 times uh, within kind of uh, uh, below about one Kelvin. Uh, so in addition to this kind of a, uh, fast uh, change of resistance as a function of temperature, we can also uh, do like a kind of IV curve to look at the nonlinear transport uh, response. So here basically we look at uh, uh, the, the voltage as a function of uh, uh, bias current. So what we can see is that when the bias uh, at the lowest temperature, we can see that the the bias current is actually, uh, when the bias current is very small, the voltage is kind of uh, almost zero. That means you have very small resistance. And it becomes very nonlinear when the uh, current actually is beyond a critical current. That's about 10 nano uh, amp. Then what we, oh, uh, then basically we see the resistance increase very strongly. And this nonlinear IV curve uh, becomes less and less when you go to higher temperature. And on the right hand side, it's effectively plotting the same thing. We just plot dV, dI as a function of current. So this basically tells us the resistance directly. So we found that uh, initially uh, below the critical current, the resistance is very small. And then beyond the critical current, the resistance uh, increased uh, very quickly. Uh, in, in addition to the pure uh, transport measurement, we also study the magnetic field uh, dependence. So if we kind of uh, apply uh, out of plane magnetic field uh, and look at the basically dV, dI over kind of I behavior, what you can see is at high magnetic field, this nonlinear IV curve gets strongly suppressed. So if we go to uh, about 0.7 or 0.8 Tesla, the superconductivity state more or less get destroyed. 
uh, and so basically it's weakened by high vertical magnetic field. And if you apply vertical magnetic field, it actually couples both to uh, spin and order uh, orbital degree of freedom in, in graphing. So we also did in-plane magnetic field dependence, uh, as we show here. So if you apply a large in-plane magnetic field, again, you see kind of a, the superconductivity gets suppressed uh, with a magnetic field in the order of one Tesla. But we also see something kind of uh, uh, unusual in the sense when the superconductivity state gets uh, destroyed, we actually see our resistance peak at the, the zero bias. Uh, until now, we actually don't know what it means, wh wh why it comes which about. Which filling is this? These are all close to quarter filling, quarter. so it's kind of a doped quarter filling. Okay, so um, by combining this transport nonlinear IV as well as magnetic field uh, dependence, we kind of uh, are reasonably confident this is actually a superconducting state. And then if we look at the phase diagram, this is uh, what it uh, looks like. So. Uh, so this again is kind of a change in doping. So what we found is uh, the, the superconducting state actually has two dome-like features close to the quarter filling. And uh, in particular, we actually found that this dome is r relatively narrow. So basically, uh, the, uh, it actually, the, the superconducting state basically uh, disappear when you have, say, uh, 20 or 30 percent deviation of uh, one whole uh, polarity site. And that's uh, all at least uh, uh, analogous to what has been seen in uh, high PC superconductor, where uh, you can have superconducting dome, and this dome is kind of a relatively uh, small. Yes? Does the magnetic field affect the insulating behavior too? Or there is not much effect of magnetic field on the insulation. Yes, the magnetic field also uh, affect the insulating behavior. Uh, it's rather complicated. Uh, so I, uh, I mean, if you are interested, maybe we can discuss later. Like, uh, uh, yeah, it turns out when when they are very strongly insulating, they are less sensitive to the magnetic field. But if they are close to the metal insulators transition, then the magnetic field play a much more dramatic role. How large are the samples in you know, linear dimensions? Yeah, this um, may be 4 micron by 2 micron. Uh, so, oh, in addition to just uh, kind of a change the doping and look at the phase diagram, we can actually fix the doping to be uh, kind of close to quarter filling and uh, vary the vertical electric field, basically change the bandwidth and see <coughs> when does the superconductivity state uh, emerge. And this uh, is what we see, like uh, if you or don't uh, apply any vertical electric field, basically you just have a metallic state. Uh, the bandwidth initially is too large, you actually don't have much strong correlation. And when you, let's focus on this side, when you apply a large uh, vertical electric field, basically you squeeze the bandwidth and you can get into a mod insulating region over here. But what you can see is that although like, you can have well-defined mod insulator, you actually don't uh, get superconductivity over here. Uh, so it's only when you apply even higher uh, electric field, then the superconductivity kind of uh, emerge over there. So basically, superconductivity doesn't always appear if you just have a multi insulated state and dope it. So it's only in certain phase space it show up. Or well, we don't understand what it means, uh, and uh, I think it will take a lot of effort trying to figure out what's the kind of uh, internal relations between this co uh, superconducting state and uh, this uh, MOT uh, starting state. Okay, so with that, uh, the last I would like to talk about uh, topological aspects of these uh, 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 kind of a marine minibands in the trilayer graphing and ball nitride system. So oh, in order to do that, uh, let me just first review quickly about uh, topology in graphing in general. Uh, uh, it's great that uh, Leon actually gave a great introduction, so my uh, task here will be quite a bit simpler. So uh, Leon actually already told you that uh, if you uh, get a monolayer graphing, uh, you can actually, uh, or you, you have many different ways to get it, or, and one of them is basically break AB sub lattice symmetry. That's the one that's relevant to uh, our talk. So in that case, basically, you can uh, basically uh, create a diagonal uh, gap term over here. And if you look at the, the kind of a, a 
K and K prime point, you see there's a gap uh, happening at the linear cone. And if you look at the pseudo spin, actually, uh, of the electron wave function at the K and K prime point, you find that basically there is a finite Berry curvature close to the gap. So if you go around, you will find that uh, uh, you have a kind of phase of negative pi for the conduction band and a phase of positive pi for the valence band in K prime point. <laughs> And if you go to K point, you basically have uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, Berry curvature and Berry phase. So, uh, uh, and a very interesting thing to notice is basically uh, the Berry phase that you have actually depend on the sign of the gap. And the sign of the gap is actually controlled by the vertical electric field direction. So if you change the vertical electric field direction, you can actually <coughs> switch the Berry uh, curvature Berry phase here from uh, say pi to negative pi when you go from positive gap cross to zero and go to negative gap. Uh, although this is very interesting, you have a non-trivial Berry curvature and you actually have a kind of electrical field tunable Berry curvature. Uh, when you think about the whole system, yeah, it's kind of a trivial in the sense that uh, the K and K prime value band are not really separated. They are all connected through high energy uh, state. So this actually overall together form a single band, and then the total chain number for this uh, single band uh, is zero. So all monolayer graphing uh, is easy to understand. It turns out the trilayer graphing is quite uh, analogous to monolayer graphing. Uh, so if you look at the trilayer graphing, the simplest band structure actually can be described uh, as this. So instead of uh, basically pi delta pi on the diagonal term, you actually have pi delta pi to kind of nth power if you have n layer A, B, C uh, type of uh, graphing. So basically for trilayer graphing, basically you have pi delta to the third power. Uh, so what that means is if you have a trilayer graphing and you open up a gap, then again, there is a phase winding going around the band. And instead of pi, uh, in monolayer graph, you actually have three pi. So you have, say, negative three pi here <coughs> and positive three pi here once you open up a small gap. Uh, and this gap, unlike monolayer graphing, well, we draw the gap kind of artificially, but in trilayer graph, you can really open the gap by the applied vertical electric field. And when you switch the vertical electric field, you can actually change this uh, uh, Berry curvature of individual uh, band at the k and the k prime value. But again, if you only have uh, pristine trilayer graphing, this k and the k prime value band again will connect with each other. So you don't have kind of a well-defined uh, chain number. But that's what uh, the Maurice super lattice actually uh, does the trick. So once we have the Maurice super lattice, uh, we basically uh, uh, have flatter bands, so band with smaller bandwidths. But what you can see is when you have Maurice super lattice, basically you, you get out things over here, right? You actually start to form this kind of a, a completely separated Mori band where the K band and the K prime band are not kind of talking to each other anymore. You actually have a separated mini band at the K point. And you also have a time reversal pair, basically a separated uh, mini band at the kind of a big k point and big k po uh, k prime point of the original graphene Brillouin zone. So now this is interesting because if you now have an isolated kind of a mini band, then this mini band must have a well defined <coughs> integer chain number. I mean, it's zero or non zero, uh, but, but it has to have a well defined uh, kind of a uh, chain number. And more, also very interestingly, in this case, we can still use vertical electric field to open up a gap and then close the gap and open up a negative gap. That means we can actually use the uh, kind of uh, electric field to basically change the chain number. So if we initially have a band, even if initially the band has trivial topology, has zero chain number, when, once we actually apply electric field to close the gap and open a negative gap, we will actually invert the uh, band, and that should give us a non-trivial topology. Uh, so that basically, with the electric field, you should uh, be able to uh, control the uh, band chain number. And this is indeed uh, what uh, theoretical calculation shows. 
So this is a ABC trilayer graphing uh, when you apply, say, a positive vertical electric field. So what we found is uh, once you open up a small gap uh, at the uh, kind of a, a initial um, uh, band gap, so close to the band gap, there will be a lot of barrier curvature, and that will create a phase winding similar to just uh, like isolated trilayer graphing. You basically have a phase winding of 3 over 2 <coughs> and negative 3 over 2 uh, coming from the band minimum. But at the same time, the total chain number has to be integer. Or uh, another like a uh, half value should come from somewhere else. It turns out uh, kind of uh, at the top of the mini band, uh, you actually also have quite a bit uh, berry phase and berry curvature. And when you add the whole uh, phase uh, kind of a berry curvature together, you find in this case, uh, the, the kind of uh, or top of the mini band and bottom of the mini band add to a chain number equal to 3 for the valence band, and for conduction band it goes to 0. And then now if you change the uh, vertical uh, electric field, what you can see is like the electric field mainly switch the gap uh, at the bottom, so it actually doesn't change too much of the barrier curvature around the kind of a band maximum but it will switch the curvature at the band minimum. So now this goes from 3 over 2 to negative 3 over 2. So in this case, basically you can switch the valence band from a topological kind of chain, equal, uh, chain number equal to 3 to chain number equal to 0. And this is quite robust in single particle uh, system. So even if you somehow didn't do it correctly and you didn't find the exact chain number uh, for a specific state, but the change of chain number equal to 3 and negative 3 is actually uh, very robust, no matter what kind of a, a model that you use. Uh, and this was indeed kind of a predicted uh, very quickly after, uh, uh, after we have shown that the trilayer graphing and the Born nitride can form more super lattice. And then that gives us a very interesting question now. Like we can have like a, a, or individual mini bands that has finite chain number. At the same time, it actually is rather flat. So if we have like a flat band plus a chain band, can we get basically a correlated chain insulator? So we were really excited by this uh, uh, possibility, and we spent quite a bit of effort uh, trying to look for it in our trilayer system. Uh, so just again, just plot uh, this uh, phase diagram. As I have told you, that uh, we can control the like uh, or electric field uh, direction and magnitude, uh, basically change the bandwidth, and we can control the kind of doping. So previously, we have studied mostly on the side of like uh, uh, zero chain number because in those sides, actually the multi insulator is more defined. Uh, it's stronger, and then we actually see the superconductivity uh, state. And then the, the side with non-trivial chain number is when you switch the electric field, and that basically will be this side. So we basically all examine all the kind of uh, phase diagram on this side much more carefully, and in particular, uh, so here basically we show uh, the behavior when you apply uh, again, uh, uh, this is actually magneto uh, transport uh, study. So we measure the, this is Rxx as a function of doping and as a function of vertical magnetic field uh, with a relatively large vertical electric field for the topological side. So I think this says is about 0.5 volt per nanometer. That's the displacement field. So what we can see uh, again is actually at half filling there seems to be a fairly well-defined uh, multi-insulator state. But at quarter feeding, we can see the behavior is rather different. Um, in particular, we actually see a Landau fan kind of a type of uh, uh, state over here. So it's actually a quantum hole state defined by uh, Rxx uh, close to zero. It has a slope that corresponds to uh, uh, nu equal to two uh, quantum hole state. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, quantum hole state uh, is quite interesting in several aspects. So basically, uh, for this correlated band, uh, like basically the whole mini band, we don't see well-defined quantum oscillations in most of the situations, and certainly not at very low magnetic field. So this is the only one 
you actually see a well-defined quantum Hall state uh, go all the way to basically uh, almost zero field, and it actually destabilizes this multi-insulated cell. And it exists only on the side when the band is actually topological. It doesn't exist on the side when the band is trivial. And also, you don't see basically any other uh, uh, Landau level quantum host state. So most likely, we <coughs> believe this is not a coming from a single particle Landau. So is it coincidence that you're seeing this topological feature at this, at like this bottom right quarter, quarter filling, which is the same place where you saw superconductivity? Or oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I, okay. <laughs> I should have <laughs> switched the, or changed the, the, the diagram a little bit. So, sorry. Uh, uh, so, it turns out that these two, this, the, the one that I actually, the, the two devices I showed, uh, happens to be on two different devices, and the aligned boron nitride is on the opposite side. So, uh, okay, so basically, so for this device, we also see superconductivity, but, but I didn't show the same data. Uh, so it turns out superconductivity only exists on this side. So you need a fairly large vertical electric field, but also the trivial, top, uh, trivial uh, band in order to see, see superconductivity. <laughs> so for, for the other device, it happens to be rotated by 180 degrees. So, so, sorry. Do you understand that relation? Like, why, why does having a non-trivial churn number forbid you from having superconductivity, or is that just coincidence? No, no, so again, for trivial chain number, we can see superconductivity. So that's somewhat analogous to doped multi-insulator. So for the topological side, where we see the chain band, we actually do not see any superconductivity. And, uh, or if we can see <laughs> superconductivity on the topological side, we'll be very happy. We haven't seen it, and there are some arguments that it will be harder to realize. At least uh, uh, if you have purely topological band, you actually don't have well-defined multi-insulating state. At least uh, you cannot understand it as like a doped multi-insulator type of uh, scenario. Um, just another really, maybe really common, but uh, also a uh, Stanford's group uh, on tissue bibliography, when they saw this uh, quantized Hall effect, they do not see superconductivity. That's also true. While the uh, MIT device uh, shows superconductivity, and never, so far at least, uh, see any uh, turn insular behavior. That's right. So it seems all consistent. <laughs> yeah, they are kind of consistent in that way. Yeah, yeah. So it seems uh, the chain insulator and superconductivity at least doesn't want to coexist so far. Right? So there do you have. XY, RXY, or sigma XY data for this? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, uh, yeah, we also have sigma XY. So this actually plus the RXY data uh, specifically along this line. So what we can see is actually RXY uh, is quite well quantized all the way to about, say, 0.2 Tesla. And then uh, when you actually switch the direction of the magnetic field, uh, it changed very abruptly, and also even at the zero magnetic field, the hole resistance uh, uh, is not zero. So we actually see a fairly large anomalous hole uh, signal, uh, although not fully quantized. Uh, so yes. Uh, have you finished? Yeah, I finished. So when you were saying the churn number is three, while well, here nu is equal to two, is there any explanation of the? Uh, I'll come back. I'll come to that point. Yes. Uh, Okay, so so basically, uh, uh, we 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 kind of see uh, a kind of a quantum host state go to all the I mean close to zero magnetic field uh, and a large anomalous host signal and indeed uh, at zero magnetic field the anomalous host signal shows well defined hysteresis so you can see the ferromagnetic behavior uh, so at zero temperature the the core civic field is about zero point zero three Tesla. And then if you go to higher uh, temperature, it kind of uh, disappear at about two or three uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, and this uh, hysteresis behavior kind of is well behaved and becomes uh, reduced when you have a uh, higher temperature. Uh, there are two things I would like to uh, point out is basically, although we see ferromagnetic uh, behavior, uh, we, behave, we believe this is completely due to orbital degree of freedom. Spin is actually not involved at all. So we have a system there is almost zero spin orbital interaction, and we don't care about the spin at all, and it actually can give you a pure orbital induced ferromagnetism. Uh, I think that 
might exist only in graphing or the conventional ferromagnetism actually uh, is usually due to spin or with very strong spin orbital interaction. And then as a result, the oh, almost close to quantum uh, anomalous Hall effect uh, then is really coming from the orbital degree of freedom. And I think to some extent that's actually very analogous to the original Haldane model where you only need to consider the hopping between kind of uh, the, 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 the electrons and you only need to have basically an orbital degree of freedom. Uh, so then uh, the question then is like, uh, oh, why do we see the correlated chain band with uh, C equal to 2? So I would like to make uh, two comments. One is actually, or C equal to 2 is kind of interesting in the sense that uh, if we look at the quantum hole system uh, coming from Landau levels, so each Landau level actually always have a chain uh, number of 1. So each band has a chain number uh, equal to 1. And then also in previous materials where people observe quantum anomalous hole effect, actually each band also has a chain number equal to 1. So this may be the first uh, s uh, situation where the kind of it has an intrinsic mechanism and the chain number of the band itself is actually larger than 1. So that tells us how oh, we can not only realize quantum hole like behavior, it might even go beyond uh, quantum hole physics because if you have chain number larger than 2, it's possible that can host some topological phenomena that you actually don't see from like uh, uh, lambda levels. Uh, but again, like also, why is it equal to two rather than three, as we uh, would expect from a single particle uh, calculation? So this also puzzled us uh, uh, a lot, and uh, so we had a collaboration with Professor Santo uh, uh, and uh, like Yahui from uh, MIT who did the work. So uh, he actually showed that uh, all because this uh, whole mini band uh, is not that far away separated from the, uh, the, the second whole mini band, when you have strong electron electron interaction, it actually can hybridize the adjacent band to some uh, extent. And then, if you uh, kind of uh, have mixing of adjacent band, the exact uh, chain number in the uh, in the flat band actually can change depending on electron electron interaction. So he used basically our relatively straightforward Hartree Fock calculation, and this is uh, uh, his prediction. So uh, it turns out when the dielectric screening is very large, that means when the electron interaction is very small, as you can see, uh, once you open up a gap, the chain number is always equal to three. But then when you, uh, when you reduce the dielectric screening, that means increase the electron-electron interaction, the chain number actually can change. So in our experiment, we have a dielectric constant around 4 coming from boron nitride. And we have a gap opening in the, in the order of like 20 mEV. So at least possibly it can have a chain number equal to 2. So what this says basically, it turns out that the, the exact chain number is actually not fixed. It does depend on electron-electron interaction. So the correlation actually plays more than one role in kind of a, the, the, this um, uh, anomalous whole state. So basically, it allows symmetry time reversal symmetry breaking to show the magnetism, and it actually can also affect the uh, exact number uh, of the. Yes. Can you tune either of these parameters in your experiment to see if you actually have this different? Elsewhere. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so we can easily tune uh, things along uh, this line. So this basically just applying a vertical electric field. So when the uh, gap is too small, actually, so what happens is like uh, it turns out uh, our multi insulator actually exists uh, only in a relatively narrow phase diagram. For example, uh, in this, when the gap is very small, we actually don't see. We, we actually don't see this chain insulator uh, state because the correlation is not strong enough. Uh, on the other side, when the field is too strong, it turns out the chain insulator also disappears. We don't quite know uh, what, what's happening over there. But so, so basically, mostly we have seen things around here. Uh, uh, changing the dielectric constant is an interesting possibility. We're actually trying to explore it, for example, by using different dielectric environment rather than pure boron nitride, uh, and these are still a work in progress.
Okay, so with that, uh, I think I, I will conclude. So basically, uh, I have shown you that uh, uh, if we actually just combine our relatively reasonably large effective mass and uh, more super lattice, it can actually be a very general approach to engineer strong correlation into the heterostructure. So you don't really need uh, any magic, so you just need have a finite Mori super lattice and uh, with non-zero effective mass. Uh, and this can indeed be realized in many situations. So for example, we can we show the trilayer graphing on ball nitride. So as in this case, uh, and the nice thing about trilayer graphing is not only you can realize the correlation, but also with vertical electric field, you can actually change the bandwidth and also switch the topology. I think that may be the part that makes this particularly interesting. Uh, but you can also realize it in transition metal dichotronite heterostructures or black phosphorus heterostructure where you actually have like a, uh, uh, like a rectangular lattice rather than kind of triangle lattice. So that can also be interesting in that aspect. Uh, so compared with uh, well, magic angle twisted bilayer graphing, so this actually requires a very unusual kind of a balance between kind of strong hybridization between adjacent layers but also a very large dispersion of a monolayer, so you really need the magic angle in order to have it happen. So it's kind of a rather, I mean, it can only realize in basically twisted bilayer or twisted bilayer on bilayer. But, but the, I think this approach is quite a bit more general. So for many 2D semiconductors, I would say most of the 2D semiconductors, once you can form a well-defined Mori super lattice, you will be able to realize a strong correlation. Uh, with that, I also like to thank people who helped to done this work. So most of the studies spearheaded by Guo Rui, uh, who well, really did a wonderful uh, work, and he had help from uh, these students and postdocs. We have very strong collaboration uh, in this study uh, with Professor Yuan Bo Zhang, uh, who helped in device and some of the transport. And uh, all the lowest temperature measurements are done in Stanford with Professor David Goldhub Gordon. And this, uh, we also get uh, Zhi Wen uh, with uh, sample fabrication and BM from the Japan group. And the original single particle band calculation uh, is coming from Jiao Jiang. And the like, chain insulator calculation is from uh, Santo in MIT. And uh, that's it. And welcome more questions. Okay. Any questions? It seems that the, the flat band and trilayer graphene is coming from the trilayer graphene itself. So can you try to disentangle the role of the moiré super lattice and the uh, structure of the trilayer itself? What does moiré add to this? How crucial is this to get the yes. theory? Yes. Yeah. So basically, the trilayer graphene initially is relatively flat, so it has a relatively large effective mass, but Mori is really critical because if you don't have uh, Mori super lattice, although at the low energy part is kind of a, okay, <coughs> let's say, at the low energy part is relatively flat, but if you don't have Mori, this band just keep going on to many EVs. So with Mori, basically, you actually cut it off at a small momentum region. And then this really makes it, the, the, the flat part comes from initially is relatively flat, but also it's very important you cut it off at a finite, a very small momentum. So you have these hysteresis curves for rho x, y uh, that you showed. So in the saturation value, how, how is it close to the quantized value to uh, yeah, okay, so quantized value should be uh, about 15, and here we see about a 9 to 10. Mm -hmm. So it's not perfectly quantized yet. <coughs> so we think there is possibility there are kind of a diff... I mean, at the zero magnetic field, it's possible you have different domains of the... I mean, so for the quantized one, we, we think it's basically a fully very polarized in K or K prime. Uh, so I think at zero magnetic field, there might be like magnetic domains where some part are K-value polarized, some are K-prime value polarized, and that can lead to um, non-ideal quantization. So if we can make better sample and uh, do it at lowest temperature, we hope that we can improve this. Yes? 
So in the superconducting case, it seems the imaging and the whole doping are very different. Are there any reason for this asymmetry? Oh, we don't know. So this is just experimental observation. We actually don't know what's the origin of superconductors. So I think uh, <coughs> we need to really work with the theories and have more controlled measurement to understand what's going on. Yes? I'm a little bit confused. So in the single particle calculation, we obtain some sort of a band which has non-zero charge number, which kind of requires time reversal symmetry to be broken. So how is that introduced in the single particle calculation? Okay, sorry, no, 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 oh, okay, maybe I went too fast on that. Um, so, okay, uh, yeah, I guess I didn't have a very good, yeah, so basically there are, I mean, there are always two uh, uh, time reversal pairs, so they, they, you have a band at the K point, and you have a band at K prime point. So the time reversal pair of K mini band is actually K prime mini band. So if you add the two bands together, the total chain number equals to zero, but each one of them has a finite chain number. And what happens is like uh, at the uh, kind of a low temperature, everything will actually spontaneously break time reversal symmetry, and you have a very polarized state. So basically you have only field K value and a completely empty K prime value. So in that case, basically you have, you break time reversal symmetry to stay in a single value, and then you basically also see a finite chain number, like a four, uh, only a field band of the k value, but not the k prime value. Is that what you mean when you said orbital magnetism? Yes. So basically, that purely coming from you are feeling so the valley polarization. Valley polarization. Exactly. That's you right. also called it orbital magnetism. Yeah. So orbital basically, what? Yeah. So valley is purely yeah, orbital yeah. effect. Yeah. 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 I should have explained at a. So uh, how's the homogeneous of your contacts, or oh, I mean sample? Uh, can you see similar behavior in different pairs of contacts? Or yeah, so it turns out that in our sample, is uh, uh, in terms of that homogeneous, is rather homogeneous. So all the contacts show almost the same behavior. Uh, and uh, that's kind of understandable in the sense that uh, this Maury super lattice is actually determined by basically lattice match uh, mismatch between graphene and boron nitride, which has a 15 nanometer uh, period. So, and we have close to zero twist angle. So, first, the zero twist angle is kind of the lowest energy state, so the graphene actually prefer to go to that state. But even if there is a small change, say 0.1 or 0.2 kind of a uh, local change compared with the initial uh, Maurice super lattice, that's a relatively small effect. So, so as a result, we yeah we mostly see the behavior is fairly homogeneous. So, so is there any like a reason that, that like the quantum Hall transition when like, goes directly from minus two to plus two without any intermediate uh, plateau, which seems from band structure theory is a little bit uh, fine tuned or with some special reason behind it, like usually number does not jump by four. Uh, okay, so so to, to, to answer that question, so so first uh, these are actually already you you open up the gap already. Yeah. So basically, this is more like a ferromagnetic transition you can imagine. Like uh, <coughs> so, you have a fully k value polarized to fully k prime value polarized. If you basically change the magnetic field, so 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 we would. Uh, Basically, imagine it uh, at least at high magnetic field, it should really go here. Uh, in the middle, it has a fairly sharp change, but uh, of course, it doesn't happen at the. I mean, it's still a somewhat <coughs> gradual change. So I don't know what you are referring to, like. Like, uh, like so it's so you don't see probably. So what I can rephrase the question like this: If people can, so you 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 have no. So it's it's not it's probably usually you can see like I'm not sure like the number equals one and ten number equals zero and ten number equals minus one those kind of uh, yeah for this actually maybe not so I think uh, the the oh okay so you are okay so I actually don't know what to expect uh, so these are both ferromagnets 
Yeah, so these are both fermagnet one way to a fermagnet pointed the other way. Yes. yes. So that's our understanding. So it's not the usual Hall mm -hmm. transition. Yeah. Right, right. It's not a usual Hall. But but this number relies on that somehow, for instance, in the original calculation, you need to have a quadrat, like quad, like cubic k plus i k somehow. So is there any symmetry reason or would that, or like, if I have a lower order term, it will? Yeah, I guess basically this, for example, uh, like the, the, the chain number of that band is really defined by the band structure, or including the electron electron interaction. So there's, I mean, it's really just two. It's not that it goes from zero to one to two. I mean, so unlike uh, the Landau levels, basically you just feel one Landau level, uh -huh. and then you feel the second Landau level, you go from zero to one to two. So this is basically a single band already have a chain number that's diff larger than one. Okay, thank you again, uh, Professor Awang. Um, so let's give him a round of applause again. <laughs>